Gigi is the CEO of Ebo AI and um, really one of the leaders here that I've seen in Malta bringing forward business, uh, business case and being very successful in, in his business dealings. So I, I, I greatly admire everybody on this panel. Um, it was good to hear most of the discussions centering around clinical AI, but I'd like to also bring focus to basic concepts like patient engagement. Healthcare providers fail on the most basic task, and that is being openly available to communicate with patients 24-7. Our focus has been radically transforming that particular interface. So I do believe that virtual agents play a very important part in augmenting human capability, in automating that touch point that a healthcare provider needs to have with the patient. And that does reduce anxiety and it does assist in the workflows that we typically observe. I can build on what Nate said in this way. If an AI tool can create better conversations, which as a result allow the patient to be more invested in his and her care plan, and as a result that does create clinical outcomes, then you've got a nice linear correlation between the technology and the outcomes which are, you are creating. So I believe, Daniela, the way to address your concern, which is entirely justified, is for us, clinicians, public health experts, and technologists to understand where AI can be beneficial. And certainly, that is not everywhere. Yes. Beyond the, the discussion we should typically have about technical security, so cryptography and so on, I think one of the areas which is of interest to us because it does touch on security in a clinical environment is this concept that AI helps to foster accountability. So we typically have more clear registers of activity which show us the chain of custody of different pieces of data, of conversations, of interactions. And this is where I think we all can tie it into Daniela's point earlier about sustainability and equity. So if the models which we use to train our AI are correctly trained and are as devoid of bias as possible, one other aspect of security is ensuring that when we execute these models, we have less human error. And that's a very important process in diagnostic medicine because that's exactly what you want to reduce. You want to reduce bias, which comes out of familiarity, exhaustion, time at work, and so on and so forth. So security to me has these two levels, the technology, technological level, which we want to ensure is in place, infrastructurally too, but more importantly, clinical security. And perhaps I'll add a point about sustainability. It's good that we talk about this you know, two-stream world, a developed world and a less developed world. We need to ensure that the AI models that we develop are not simply made available to less developed parts of the world, but are sustainably fixable in those parts of the world. So it's not simply an act of charity which brings them over from the States or Europe to Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's actually creating the skills to make sure that they are perpetually observed, that they are kept accountable, that we're promoting human safety, and that the concept of transparency, which apparently the minister spoke about this morning, is maintained even in the less developed nations. Gigi, can you say something about specialization in these cases? I will. Um, well, let me start off by saying that accessibility is not only about lack of access to technology, Brian, but it's also about psychological barriers. So I think the point which um, Maxine was making earlier is fear keeps people back from accessing technology, not because they don't have the devices to do so, but because there's a specific barrier which limits them. And I think the solution to that is quite clearly articulated. I think we need to move away from the aggrandized hype that presently exists in our market. I think it is a disservice when companies or nations over-promote the benefits that AI can realistically bring in the market. So I think we need to be transparent about the benefits and the risks that technology have. And we need to ensure that patients, especially when AI becomes very complex, can understand how it supports their care, allowing humans to always have the agency to override technology decisions. So we should widen discussion about accessibility from tablets and smartphones and 5G and so on to something which is more, more, more innate, and that is the irrational psychological fear or distance of using technology. That's the real barrier. Patient engagement will increasingly be about a blended service. I think Maxine put it quite rightly. So I think that one of the key fundamental practices that we put in place earlier on 
is to understand when AI hasn't understood the context, when it is unable to understand the intent and sentiment of that conversation, and when it therefore needs to escalate to a human agent. When you understand that particular interface point, that creates the exact blend of human and AI skills. That's why I think that AI is not here to replace human agency, and it needs to augment it in the best way possible. And of course, as Nate said, it all starts off with the right personalization of the AI tool. So part of our team actually works on giving a character to the AI virtual agent, but ensures that the identification of it being an AI tool is the fundamental starting point.